Tonight we're beginning a study of Hosea chapter 7. And when you look at the main outline that, I, that we're working from, we are dealing with the second par- portion of the book which deals further with Israel's corruption. Chapter 5 also dealt with how Israel had corrupted herself, whereas chapter 6 served as a demonstration of Israel's insincerity and her repentance. And we're also going to see further demonstration of in, her insincerity as well here in chapter 7. But this chapter further emphasizes what chapter 5 did, Israel's corruption, how she corrupted herself. And, and we're going to notice this under two main headings. Uh, you will note on your outline the first seven verses will deal with Israel's moral decay. And then the second half, verses 8 through 16, will look at Israel's misguided and really foolish alliances. And as we set the stage for our lesson, you will note on your outline I gave you some foundational passages to consider in, uh, in your personal study as well. We won't read them, obviously, but we do want to allude to them to start with. And the basic principle that, got, that has always been required of God's people, no matter the age, is this. To not be conformed to the world. And don't allow the world to entice you to engage in their behavior. And we're very familiar with Romans 12, verse number 2, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. And, you know, other passages such as Ephesians 5, 11, 2 Corinthians 6. And certainly the same principle was given in different terminology to Israel there in the book of Exodus when God warned Israel, you know, Don't make a covenant with the Canaanites or don't make a covenant with their idols as well. Now, why would God warn Israel then not to do that? There you go, Sister Cindy, lest they become like them. And uh, we remember, did God call Israel out of Egypt to be like the heathen nations round about? Nope. Nope. As Christians today, have we been called, called out of the world to be like the world? No, no, we have not. We are to be different. But the problem is, and we see this with God's people of every dispensation, is the willingness to become like the world. And, to, to, and as a result, to, to lose their distinctive identity. Because they are conforming their lives to the world. And, and Hosea, as we pointed out, really reveals not only Israel's moral corruption, but also the reality that due to her faithlessness, as seen in her refusal to rely upon God by turning to men to try to solve their problems, we see that her corruption had gotten to the point that they wouldn't even turn back to God. And this chapter certainly is a revelation of an age-old problem of worldly conformity rather than godly transformation. And it reveals to us the tendency to rely upon man rather than on God to solve problems which are spiritual in nature. In this chapter, our study will certainly show the folly, the foolishness, and futility of such manner of living. And so as we begin tonight, if someone would, let's, let's start off by reading verse number 1. Let's go ahead and read, let's start off with verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, the Lord brings Chapter 7. How about that? Now, what appealed is that the dignity of Ephraim was uncovered. The wickedness of Samaria, the land of many fall, a thief comes in, a band of robbers takes full outside. All right, thank you, Brother Keith. There's two points to consider here. What did God desire? What was God's desire for Israel here in this verse? To heal them. Now, what does this reveal to us about God? Even though Israel had sinned, even though though she had rebelled against God, even though God had pronounced punishment on them, what was still his his desire for for this wicked people? To return. return. So what does this tell us about God? He's long-suffering. Now, does this also tell us that even though he will punish people for sin... That, it, that it's not his desire to punish? Indeed, I think that's a point to be made here. 
And, and it shows us God's desire is for mankind to be saved from sin, to, to turn from it, to, to come and return to Him. And I believe it also shows that God takes no pleasure when men persist in sin and die in sin, does, does it? Does God take pleasure when the wicked die in a lost condition? Absolutely not. And I gave you several passages on your outline that certainly affirm this, and, and we're very familiar with this, with this all. And so we recognize that God will punish, does punish and will punish sin. But again, God is not sadistic. He does not take any pleasure whatsoever in doing so. But He must in order to satisfy His holiness, His, 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 His righteousness, and His justice. But yet it, it certainly does not please Him to have to mete out vengeance against the wicked. So that's what God desired was to heal Israel. Now what did he discover in all of this? Their iniquity, exactly, Sister Cindy. He, saw, he discovered that they had this stubbornness, a refusal to repent. He saw their lawlessness. He saw their wickedness. He saw the falsehoods that were committed. The, thiev the, the fact that thievery was widespread. How corrupt was the nation? According to this verse, by, the, by this time, how corrupt was Israel? All the way to the top. Again, the fact that, that, that the usage of the tribe of Ephraim is used in the capital of Israel, Samaria is used, demonstrate the pervasiveness of sin, and that the influence of sin, as leaven... Had leavened, the whole of, had leavened the whole of Israel. And as Sister Dusty pointed out, it went all the way to the top, as we're going to see here in just, in just a moment. So while God desired to heal Israel, He dis discovered that they had a refusal to repent. They didn't want to be healed. They wanted to continue doing things their way. And as a result, let's look at verse number 2, if someone would read this. What Israel failed to recognize... Uh, chapter 7, Brother Larry. All right, thank you, Brother Larry. Now, what does this tell us about Israel? What does this verse tell us about Israel? What did they think they could do? They thought they could hide from God. And uh, they failed to recognize that God knew and saw all that they did. And again, the idea of before my face emphasizes, well, you know, God saw it. Perhaps they had arrogantly thought that, you know, well, we cannot see God, thus His presence and power are not here, so it does not matter what we do, God's not going to see it. Do you think that's the attitude men have today? Always, well. Yeah. Tried to hide his sin. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, they tried to hide in the. They tried to hide in the bushes. They tried to sew themselves together fig leaves, thinking that that God wouldn't discover what they had done. But just as all of them failed to consider, just what Israel failed to consider is that God knows everything and sees everything. And certainly we, again, you note the outline, the pa passages I give you. And uh, they certainly stress the reality that the eyes of, of God are in every place. In the eyes of God beholds both the good and the evil. Again, there's an old song we sing. There's an old song. There's an all-seeing eye watching you and I. And uh, just as it had watched Israel, and that all-seeing eye is Jehovah God Himself. And uh, there's never a moment when we're out of the eyesight of God, is there? And that should, that's a sobering reality. Is that wherever we go, whatever we do, God is there. 
God sees. And this is a basic fundamental message that all men would do well to recognize. When we think we can hide sin or cover up sin or think that, no, that God doesn't know or refuse to acknowledge God, well, this passage here affirms that God remembers wickedness because He knows what is going on. Now let's look at verse number 3. If someone would, let's read this verse. Thank you, Sister Dusty. All right, let's... You know, their evil king delighted in their evil doings, and so did the princes with their deceits. And remember, in the northern kingdom, every single king was wicked. Now, you think this verse applies to our nation today? You know, I was preparing, studying for class, and I... And I looked at this verse and I said, yeah, you could say this about, about the United States of America. Because I believe we see a correlation between what behavior Israel exhibited then and what behavior is exhibited in our country today. What kind of behaviors does our governmental leaders revel in? What's that, Sister Dusty? Exactly right. And, uh, you know, the same thing that was going on in Israel is going on today. You know, we don't have a king in our country. We have, you know, you know, we live in a republic. But certainly the principle is true. The corruption of Israel went all the way to the top. The corruption in our nation today has gone all the way to the top. And, um, and again, that shows us Israel's moral corruption and depravity were extreme and universal. What God called Israel, it, what God called evil, excuse me, Israel called good. And, and the same holds true today. Is it, is it the reality that men, what, is that man calls evil good today? And good evil? And, it, you know, and certainly we see that in our day and age. So, so you cannot help but be impressed with, with the correlation that Hosea 7 verse 3 has to our nation today. Instead of relying upon God and His Word, well, we have politicians who, who just revel in the wickedness, who promote wickedness. And I'm afraid, and I, I would think most of you would agree, that it's only getting worse and worse, it seems. And I think someone told me, Someone told me the other night after the sermon, it just makes you wonder how long God's going to allow our nation to stand. You know, God, as we talked about in the lesson Sunday night on providence in the nations, God raises nations up, brings them down. And really here in chapter 7, we're, see, we're going to see what, reasons why God's going to bring Israel down because of her corrupt, corruption. Now, verses 4 through 7, we have a list of what Israel's behavior consisted of. If someone would, let's read these four verses at this point in time as well. Thank you, Brother Larry. And this is really beginning where you're going to see some interesting metaphors given. And really beginning in verse number 4 here. First of all, as we look at the list of what Israel's behavior consisted of, they're described as adulterers. And certainly this would apply to spiritual, their spiritual adultery as well. And because their idolatry led them there into that condition. They were unfaithful to God and they were God's bride at the time. 
And here their lust is described as an oven that has been heated to receive dough. And again, I remember working in the bakery for my dad, you know, from 97 to 2007. You know, before you could actually get the bread into the, to the oven, it had to be heated up to over 400 degrees. It had to go through the proof, proofing process before it hit the oven. And so, you know, you have to heat the oven up. And uh, that's how their lust is described, as that oven heated to receive dough. And the baker, you know, the idea of ceases from raising after kneading the dough is the idea of one who has the oven at such high heat that he ceases from heating the oven needed, and needed, the, dough, needed the dough and, until it's leavened. Uh, the baker then only requires to omit feeding it during the short time of the fer fermentation of the bread. Now, when you think about the ovens that they used during the, the biblical times here in the days of Israel, the oven was likely B-shaped with clay walls and a lid on top that could be removed, that you could easily take it off. And a wood fire would probably be lit on the dirt or stone, stone floor. So once the dough was kneaded, the cake or the dough was tossed into a round, flat shape about five to six inches in diameter and put against the inside wall uh, of the oven. Now the picture painted is of a baker with his oven ready for the dough. The people were ready to practice their sinful acts. All they lacked was the opportunity. The imagery here allows, though, for other interpretations, such as the heat of treachery, the heated pursuit of, of vain political alliances, the immoral sexual passions flamed within the context of idolatry, and so forth. Uh, the applications that, could be, that, are, that, that can be made to Israel here are, 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 are varied. But you also look at this in connection with verse number 5. And so they're heated up to do wickedness. And not only did, were they adulterers, they were conspirators. Now, the day of our king, you know, references some special day. Perhaps the day in which the king was inaugurated, the anniversary of his inauguration. Perhaps it was the king's own birthday or some other special feast day. And now notice what they did. They made him sick with bottles of wine. That is, the plotters would keep the wine flowing to the king until he was overtaken by it. And it appears that, you know, the princes were involved in this conspiracy. And those around the king brought him so much alcohol that he became unable to make the most, most basic of decisions. And, uh, and isn't this what alcohol does to an individual? It dulls the senses. And so in his drunken state, the king stretched out his hands to those who have him and have him wine. That is, he opened the way for them by becoming involved in their disregard for God, but to his own destruction. And uh, we'll get more into that here in, here in just a moment. As you look at verse 6, they have made ready their heart like an oven. And again, the idea here is, the flames of their evil passions never ceased. You know, they were inflamed with the spirit of anarchy and greed and lust. Though they were not actually engaged in the committing of these wicked acts, they were still like a smoldering oven which was and is ready to flame into action at, at the slightest provocation. Now, how sad is it when, when the thoughts of man's heart are only evil continually? It's very upset. Now, why does man get to this point? Let's ask this question. How does a nation, individual in a nation get to the point where all they can think about is committing wicked acts? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. You know, when you don't know God, you, you, it's going to lead you to, doing it, to engaging in any and every sort of base behavior. And that's what we see here. And... Yep. The, the knowledge was available to them. Maybe more. It was a great spell. They had to teach it to them. Kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Peter said, this they're willfully ignorant of. Yep. They're ignorant of it because they want to be ignorant of it. And, and, you know, I think it, it holds true today. 
probably 98 or 99 percent of the homes in the United States have at least one copy of God's Word within mm -hmm. the whole swallows. And, you know, a, a, a lot of times it's a great old big copy and it stays on the coffee table yeah. and dust it off every once in a while. Yeah, I preached a lesson on that one a few Sunday nights ago. Remember, dusty Bibles lead to dusty lives. You don't use it, you're going to... It's sadly, too, connecting into what Brother Ricky said, you know, there's a lot of preachers who are ignorant. Is there not? Think how many people sit in a church house every week somewhere. And we're not just dealing with the Lord's church. How many people are, are being fed lies every week? Untruths. Yeah. You know, that, it's sad, like you say, they're being taught untruths, but they're in their hearts, they're trying. They have a love for God. Yeah. No doubt. But then there are those who just simply don't want to accept that there is a God. And, don't, and make no mistake about it, the fact that God is being forced out of our society is having an effect as well. When you don't want anything to do with God, don't want anything to do with the Bible, it has a it has a profound effect on everything. Gospel preachers are not immune to this. When gospel preachers, you know, when they don't, when they don't preach and teach book, chapter, and verse, well, that's another asking for trouble, is it not? Here several years ago, uh, one of Kale's employees was a young man who had actually been to the Baptist seminary and was considering becoming a preacher. He wouldn't become a preacher at one time. Do you know Kale actually knew more about the Bible than he did? Wow. <laughs> that's that's sad, is it? That is sad. But that's why that's why everyone needs a good knowledge of the scriptures, is it not? You know. All you have to do is watch the History Channel, and all those men on there who think they are so smart, so well versed, the way they interpret things and how things happen, is to accept what the way God said it happened. Yeah. Just makes you shake your head. I mean, we know better, and so with us having that knowledge, it enables us to just laugh it off. You know, just laugh at their foolishness. But think about how many people who don't have that knowledge who actually fall hook, line, and sinker for that nonsense. That's the tragedy, is it not? And that's why so many people are going to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. And there's a lot of, and like Brother Keith said, there's willful ignorance too. Peter talked about that. The scoffers, they were willfully ignorant. And there's scoffers today who are willfully ignorant. And I would suggest there are some in the Lord's church, some supposed gospel preachers who scoff at the teachings of God's word. You know, and I was talking with a fellow preacher, Brother Dustin Brock preaches over in Albertville for the Blessing Congregation. He's preaching in Syria. He told me he's preaching on Sunday mornings. You know, he titled it, he's been preaching a few lessons on this, Why Modern Day Churches of Christ Can Become Lost. Why the Church of Christ Can Become Lost. And he said, it starts by forgetting the foundation. And he says, when we start referring to Bible doctrine as simply our tradition, that's not a... That's the, you forget your foundation when you start doing that, do you not? The Bible says destruction always comes after falling away. Exactly. And uh, when you forget your foundations and when you neglect the fundamentals, and when you neglect the Word of God, and you forget faith, what it means to ha forget your faith, well, you will become lost. You know, we, we've got some. I wouldn't really refer to them as gospel preachers or leaders of religious groups yeah. who used to call themselves the Church of Christ, maybe still do, uh -huh. but participating in mixed services with and Baptist congregations and so forth. I, I can't think of which one it was, but one guy was in his remarks, he said, oh, well, I was raised in the acapella tradition. <laughs> yeah. Well... I've been reading Brother Tom Holland's new book. I picked it up at the Diana Singing when we were over there the first time, Larry, Brother Larry. His new book is 10 Reasons Why I Cannot Join Your or Cannot Be a Member of Your Denomination. One of the chapters in that book it re refers to the, to the
to the church. And some brethren have made the church a denomination, have they not? Those who reject the authority of, the, of this book, as you just pointed out, Brother Keith, you know, making things, making Bible doctrine our traditions, well, we can't have a part of that, can we, when they... And Brother Tom was spot on in his observations with that. I believe so. I don't know which one it is right now, Sister Dusty. But um, I know there's one in Chattanooga. I know uh, Dale, when she used to do Sunday in some of the homes, she would go to worship services over there on Sunday morning somewhere. Mm -hmm. And she went to Hickson one time and she brought some of the things that the preacher, she told me the preacher said, Basically referring to the church as just another denomination. What is language you apply? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's all over. Susan, Susan and her parents used to attend Hicks, and they had to leave there because, because of the. Well, we used to have to pass over there. I don't know what they call it now. Clear Creek. Well, peel the fleshly lusts, you know, and brethren would, you know, it reminds you, some of our brethren, some of the, the behavior of individuals reminds you of Israel here, you know, and it is sad to watch, you know, and it, it, it is sad, you know, and I've tried to, you know, I've, you know, I've talked with several Christians who try to justify the behavior, say, you know, and after, I've pointed out before, when you try to reason with them, after you try to reason with them and they don't re listen to reason, it just sometimes makes you get frustrated that you want to go bang your head against the wall somewhere. When you plead and plead with people, you know, and they say, well, you know, that's just your opinion. And uh, I told, I told the, Brother Keith and them earlier, before everyone got here, had a conversation at, at the raceway in Scottsboro yesterday. Um, guy, guy, guy and I got to talking. He was on his way to work, and we just started chatting. And he asked me what I did, and I told him, and he said, you know, I've heard about the churches of Christ. And now i got a question. Why do you not use mechanical instruments of music in the worship? And I explained to him. And then ultimately, our conversation ended. He didn't, you know, he didn't react like some people do, singing, well, that's your opinion. He, he said, well, you gave me a lot to think about. You know, that's a much different reaction. At least you get the guy to think. If, at least that's a person who's willing to think. I gave him book, chapter, and verse. You know, and I gave him the difference between the Old Testament and the New. Why, why the Old Testament's not our law today, but why, it, though it was written for our learning. And he, you know, and I, you know, he said thanks as we ended. And he gave me a lot to think about. And I said, you know, and I thought to myself as I drove off, you never know what that might lead to. You just never know. But at the least, a seed was sown. A seed was planted. So, you know, people react differently. And sadly, as you pointed out, some just, you know, don't, don't want to hear. As Israel didn't. Now, as we pointed out before we got, there, got on into that, there is a connection between verses 4, four through 7. Because verse 7 really gives us that the... Con that the, the conspiracy is complete. The indication that they have devoured their judges, all their kings are fallen. And it is possible that Hosea here had the days of the king Jeroboam II in mind. That is, he was reigning at the time. Because during that time frame, it was here when the king Zechariah was overthrown by Shalom, who himself was overthrown by Menahem, and Menahem was overthrown by Pekah. And I gave you the passage, I gave you the, the text reference on your outline. If you really want to see king after king after king just come and go in a very short order, you, you read 2 Kings chapter 15. And you'll see, you know, plot. If you want political intrigue, if you want political intrigue, read the books of the kings. 
that, that, that'll give you all the political intrigue you want. And uh, the picture that we find here in verse 7 is one of complete moral and political chaos. And I guess you could say that would apply to our, country, our day and age today as well, would it not? As we think about the time frame in which we live, it's, it's chaos. It's chaos, and I think that's another valuable... I think this book certainly shows us another valuable reason why we need to study the, the minor prophets is that they get paint for us a picture not too different from our modern day and age. Now, as we look about at the last... As we con- conclude our look at verse number 7, and this is where we'll stop tonight. We'll pick up with verse 8 in two weeks, and I think we got, we got quite a bit done here. Now, how far gone was Israel, according to the last part of verse 7? This is one of the, to me, this is one of the saddest statements in the entire book. This could be one of the saddest statements in the entire Bible, could it not? None that calleth on me. The nation was so afflicted by sin that there was not one who called on the Lord. Just think about that. So that's you know that's a good news for us, Sister Dusty, is it not? While we're bad, while our day and nation day and time is bad, we haven't we haven't reached the point of Israel yet, have we? So you know that's why we labor because we still have. I believe God's still giving us some time because God is long suffering. Because as Sister Dusty pointed out, there are still those who are willing to call upon God. And, um, we're meant to be the salt of the earth. Yes. What God does is to, to preserve, to save. Yep. And that's what our purpose is. And the way we have to do it if we're going to be successful at it is through teaching. Through teaching? But not just salt. We are light as well. And I think Paul put it there in the book of Philippians that we are to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked nation. You know, as Christians, we have a powerful influence. We do it by teaching, and we do it by how we live. As we talked about Sunday morning in our sermon. You know, sometimes the best sermon that is preached is the one that is lived. So, we, we, you know, we teach others the good news of salvation. But also, on the other hand, we live it out in our lives, do we not? That shows the practical side of Christianity. There's the teaching side... And then there's the practical side where we demonstrate its effects in our life. You know, and that's, you know, and we reach others that way. We, we show them why they need Christ and we show the blessing of living the Christian life. You're absolutely right. If people can't see it in their lives, they're not really interested in what they've got to say about it. Exactly. You know, you know, that's why I like the old song, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. You know, Paul put it well there. The life I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God. Not, and it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. You know, and Christ lives in us when we conform our lives to His image. And, and that's why we live Christ-like in this present world. And I, t- I tell you what, you know, as we pointed out Sunday, influence goes a long way in reaching others or in trying to reach others. You may not reach them, they may not respond to the gospel, but you can leave a good impression on them. And I've had people, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, I appreciate the example you're trying to set. And I say, you know, hey, I'm not perfect. I, I make mistakes myself. I'm a human. And I sin and fall short, but hey, I do my best to live the Christ-like life. And that's what we do as Christians. All right, we'll put a peg there.